Uh, can you hear me? Good. Okay. Um, so uh, my PhD is is interdisciplinary. So that means I'm based in between uh, a faculty of business and law and a computer science department. Um, so this means I'm kind of a, a jack of several trades, but I'm not a master of any of them. Um, uh, so uh, the topic I'm going to be talking about today is digital advertising, um, how it works, how it doesn't work, and how we could uh, change the, the way that we match um, providers and goods of, of goods and services with uh, uh, customers who need to buy them. So the internet has been called the nervous system of the 21st century. Um, it's provided us incredible value, but the business model that a lot of the services we use to access it and to communicate with each other are, are free, and they're subsidized by um, a business model that's based on um, surveillance of consumers, and that is advertising. Um, so this is a $512 billion industry. Um, how does it work? Well, it's a way of matching uh, uh, the supply of goods and services with customers who want to buy them. Um, but originally, the purpose of advertising uh, was to, uh, to, to get brands to be able to be trusted. Um, and by placing an ad in a newspaper uh, or, or a billboard, it was a way of saying that they're a trusted brand, that they weren't cowboys, they weren't going to rip people off. It was also about cultural imprinting, which is the idea that if you make an association between a product and uh, a certain way of life or a certain uh, set of values, then consumers can express themselves uh, through buying the product. But those don't have much to do with the kind of advertising that funds the internet today. Um, that is uh, targeted advertising. Um, and the idea with targeted advertising is you know something about an individual and you use that knowledge to send them a special message which is designed to influence them to buy something. Um, so, for those who don't know, uh, so, so this is 20% of the ad industry, but it's the majority of the revenue of a lot of the, um, the businesses that, that provide free services online. Um, so, for those who don't know, this is a kind of a, a simplified version of how that industry works. On the one side, you've got sellers who want to sell stuff. On the other side, you've got consumers, buyers. And in the middle, you've got a very complex kind of web of intermediaries. Um, and so the sellers will have uh, marketers whose job it is to, uh, to, to try and sell stuff. They'll go to advertisers who will create um, the creative content to advertise the products. They'll use something called a demand side platform, which is an intermediary service that allows them to automatically uh, pay for ad space. Um, and they'll do that through either an ad network or sometimes an ad exchange. And the idea of an ad network is to aggregate all of the available ad space um, and allocate ads to the space. An ad exchange allows this to happen through a marketplace where there are auctions. Um, and so a publisher, so this could be any website that has uh, display advertising space, will engage with a, an ad network or an ad exchange through what's called a supply side platform. The supply side platform and the demand side platform have auctions with each other through the ad exchange. Um, and the amount that each um, display opportunity goes for depends on how much is known about the user that's visiting that page. Um, so, so there's a, there's a whole load of personal data that gets collected in order to uh, do this targeting. Um, and sometimes there'll be third party data brokers that will be involved as well. Um, and, the, and the idea is that the more that's known about an individual, the more that the ad space is worth paying for. Um, so that's how it works in theory. Um, does it actually work in practice? So just from a purely business perspective. Um, it's not really clear whether it does or not. We do know that about 44% of all the ads that are uh, served in this way are never actually in view. So that's clusters being on a page that is uh, visible to a user um, for more than one second. So the remainder, the remaining 56%, um, it's not clear whether they get seen either because they might be ignored by consumers. They might be blocked through um, ad blocking software. Then there's other things like cl click fraud. So this is where um, uh, fraudsters essentially cheat marketers out of their ad spend by generating fake clicks and views of adverts. And they charge them per click or per view. Then there's the question of whether the profiling is particularly accurate. I think in some cases it is, but in a lot of cases it isn't. Um, I logged on to uh, the ad preference manager of an ad network um, and looked at my own profile. 
and they think that I uh, am a father with two kids and that I have a pet dog. Um, as far as I know, neither of those things are true. Um, so any targeting that's, uh, they, that's uh, targeted at me on that basis is unlikely to be correct. But um, maybe there are some cases where the, uh, the, the adverts that reach people in this way are relevant to them. Um, and the, the theory is that this is good for consumers because it's more relevant adverts and therefore things that they might actually be interested in. Um, but aside from that, there are a whole bunch of problems with this uh, infrastructure for uh, consumers. The first one is surveillance. Um, the ad industry makes surveillance uh, very valuable, it encourages it, it invests in it. Um, I'm not going to go into detail on this, but I think there are lots of people uh, talking at the Congress who uh, will be able to articulate far better than me the dangers of surveillance uh, for civil, liber civil liberties. Um, the second problem is uh, the use of this infrastructure for distribution of malware. Um, so why would you try and hack into someone, uh, someone's computer if you could just simply buy access to it? So if you, if you can um, pose as a, a marketer, then you can use this infrastructure to deliver a personalized um, uh, phishing attack through an advert. So the advert will resolve, if it's clicked, to a landing page which serves um, malicious software. Um, the other problem is that with all this personal data sloshing around and being bought and sold, it's very hard to, to prevent it from getting into the wrong hands. Um, where, uh, for instance, a data broker might sell um, information about consumers. Um, there was a case uh, where this happened uh, and a Vietnamese scanning outfit just bought a whole load of personal data uh, from a data broker and then sold it on to, to others. Um, and there's the problems with personalization generally. This whole system is set up to personalize stuff, but what uh, seems to be convenient personalization to some engineers in Silicon Valley or wherever, uh, might to other groups seem more like discrimination. Um, one, one person's uh, personalization is another's discrimination. And when you can't tell how this is being done, when there's no way to scrutinize the algorithms that are driving this, um, then I think we, we have a problem. And there's a final uh, interesting psychological uh, problem with personalization, which is that if you get too much of it, then it's, uh, people tend to get freaked out. And so this is a, there's a parallel here with some research that's been done uh, in the field of robotics back in the 70s. Um, they found that uh, they were looking at how uh, people responded to robots with human features. And they found that a little bit of human features makes people respond better to robots. They prefer to, to interact with them, but only up to a point. After a certain point, uh, there's something called the uncanny valley where the robot looks too much like a human and people get freaked out because it's not quite a human, but it's almost a human. Um, and so there are some marketing companies that are seriously worrying about a similar effect um, being the case in, uh, in, in personalization that's, that's, that's done with targeted marketing. Um, so what's the solution? Um, I think there are better ways that we could devise of matching people uh, who have needs and wants uh, with the products and services that could fulfill them. Um, so I'm going to go through a few different ideas that I think um, could be really useful. So the first one is inspired by how large organizations go about buying stuff. What they don't do is they don't sit around on their computers waiting for ads to be targeted at them that are relevant to the stuff they want to buy. That would be crazy. They have procurement teams, and the procurement teams uh, have uh, a job which is to send out requests for proposals. Um, a request for proposal will say exactly what it is that they want. Um, there are all sorts of criteria that they have, internal policies, um, you know, maybe even environmental or uh, ethical policies that they have. And then suppliers have to compete uh, for that tender. Um, and they do this in a, in a reverse auction, so they compete against each other to provide the service at a good price. So this kind of infrastructure could work for uh, individuals as well. There's a service called Flubit, which is one example, where you find something online that you want to buy, um, but you don't like the price. You copy the URL, paste it into the service. And within a few hours, you will get back um, offers from companies who want to provide you with that same product at a cheaper price. And they'll be competing against each other uh, in order to deliver that, that offer to you. Um, so there's a, a guy called Doc Searles from uh, Harvard University's project uh, VRM, which stands for Vendor Relationship Management. 
Uh, and he uh, calls this intent casting. So rather than consumers responding to the messages that are put out uh, by marketers, it's actually marketers or, or suppliers of products and services that are responding to the intentions that are broadcast by individuals. But this still leaves the problem that as an individual, I don't have a great deal of power in the marketplace. Um, what gives me more power is, by, is being aggregated with lots of other people. So this is where collective purchasing comes in. Um, essentially, the idea is that by aggregating demand for, uh, for a particular good, that the, an intermediary can give consumers much more uh, bargaining power with suppliers. And this works particularly well in areas like energy. Um, you have switching schemes that have been run where uh, intermediaries like charities or local councils, and in some cases even churches, will get people together uh, and help them switch to an energy provider that can provide them with a better service at a lower price and so on. And the energy providers, even the big uh, four energy providers in the UK, were clamoring uh, to try and offer the lowest price um, in order to, to, to get the customer. Um, this isn't uh, a new idea. It's been around for a long time. Um, during the Industrial Revolution, um, workers' cooperatives pooled their labor to increase the bargaining power that they had um, with employers, but they did the same thing with um, buying household goods. Uh, they had collective purchasing, um, they called them cooperative wholesale societies, and the aim was not just to do bulk purchases, but to actually organize production and have an influence on how the goods that they bought um, were made and so on. And so uh, and the, final, the final thing I think which is worth looking at is um, assurance contracts. This is the technical term that economists use to describe uh, a Kickstarter-style pledge system. The idea is that um, you get lots of people to pledge that if enough other people do so, they will put their money into a project. And then before you even go into production, you have um, a proven demand. So it's a way of uncovering latent demand that might not otherwise be revealed through, uh, through people's purchases. And some people have advocated moving towards this model for a lot of new things, and they call this the, the, the pre-order economy. So something I think is important to, to notice with all these tools, these mechanisms, is that they're initiated by the buyer. Um, they, uh, they get to set the criteria. Um, and so only when a sale actually goes through is there any um, direct contact between the, the provider and, and the buyer. And they can also uh, be used to turn the tools of surveillance that are being used right now by marketers back on the, the providers. So there was a campaign called Move Your Money in the UK, um, which was looking at ethical banking. And it, it gathered um, thousands of people together uh, who wanted to change their bank to a more ethical bank. They did a whole load of research into which banks were most, were most ethical. Uh, and then the, on a certain date, they all switched to, to the, the one which had, which had managed to demonstrate that enough that it was ethical. Um, so there are other criteria that can be used um, other than just a particular product at a particular price. So I think the missing piece here is uh, the ability to do all these things in a decentralized way. At the moment, all of the providers of these um, services are individual organizations. They build their own software. They have to aggregate demand. Um, and they, they, they have to work in specific industries. And uh, it's not a model that scales very well across the whole marketplace. Um, so uh, I think what's, what's needed is a decentralized way of doing this. Um, so the, the idea would be that your wants and your needs would be broadcast anonymously on a decentralized network. So when I, let's say I want to buy a laptop, and I want certain specifications, I want certain operating system, there are some companies I don't want to deal with because I don't trust them, for instance. Um, so all this information can be broadcast to a decentralized network. From there, it can be aggregated into a collective alliance of other people with similar needs. And then suppliers can, uh, can then crawl that network and look at all of the, the different uh, demands that are being made and, and bid to meet those demands. And only then uh, does my purchase become linked to my identity if I want it to um, when I complete the purchase. And so um, I think there are, this, is, this is kind of an example of how, how it could work. It's a very rough sketch of how it might work. 
Um, there are people working on doing this in a decentralized way. Um, one of them is here. He's, his name's Florian Kledorfer. I think he's over there. So if you want to find out how his project is achieving this, it's called the Web of Needs. Um, I'd recommend getting in touch with him. Um, so the point of all this is um, that I think it's a better way of, of matching supply and demand. It avoids all of the problems of the uh, digital advertising um, industry as it currently stands. Um, and I think uh, it's uh, a better way of, of organizing consumer markets. Um, to conclude, I'd like to uh, put this in a broader context. Um, there's a narrative of consumer empowerment that kind of stems from the enlightenment idea that we're all individuals with um, autonomous decision-making power. We interact with each other on the market. Um, and uh, we make uh, choices based on the options that are available to us. Um, but I think this is a, is a myth. Um, it doesn't really work like that. Um, and we, when, the, when the web came along, we thought that it was going to make it even better for consumers because there'd be even more information available at our fingertips and we'd have even more ability to, to decide. Um, but actually, it doesn't really work like that. There's, there's, there's so much information out there but most of the time we're, we're, we're being targeted with advertisements rather than, than going out and searching it all. Um, and so I think what we need instead is a system that is based on, uh, on transparency from the providers, that's not based on surveillance of consumers. Um, I think it, it's important to have a system that is not about grabbing the attention uh, of consumers and, and trying to convince them to buy stuff, but that actually is based on their needs and their desires and their, their individual criteria. Um, and uh, that, that treats them as individuals with um, their own set of values rather than just manipulable, um, kind of predictable consumers. Um, so I'm not sure if I've finished ahead of time, um, but I'd be pleased to take your questions. Um, first, an answer to your question. You finished well ahead of time, okay. so we've got uh, 12 minutes for Q&A or discussion. And I see there is only one person uh, on microphone one, so go ahead. Okay, thank you for your talk. Uh, first question, you talked about advertisements that adver advertise a product, but what about advertisements that advertise a brand? Like where a car manufacturer says, hey, we, we build great cars, please mm -hmm. like us. Mm -hmm. Well, there's an interesting theory that that kind of advertising should actually be more valuable. And the, the argument there is that um, targeting allows you to pay a very small amount to target a very specific person. And so anyone can do that. Right? You don't need to be a big company with, a, with a, a lot of money to invest and have been going for a long time to do that. So actually, rationally, um, you might think that a targeted advertisement signals that you're not necessarily a very reputable brand. Whereas if you buy a double-page spread in a magazine and you, to, to, to demonstrate that you, that you have that power to do that, then people might be, be more interested in it and, and be more willing to, to respect you as a company that, that can do that. So that's one, that's one theory. Um, I think generally, um, branding advertisements are a different beast and they don't necessarily require um, surveillance because um, they're, they're normally higher profile. They're on billboards or in magazines. Okay. Um, and another thing, if the, you... Uh, actually, next question okay. was on another <laughs> microphone, See me after. which would be number two. Uh, one question for me, for me is, I see a lot of advertising in the net, uh, advertising something that is next step for advertising. So, uh, for example, if you have a free game on, on the iPad, it has advertising for the next free game uh, that maybe get some advertising for the real product. This is getting meta, meta, meta levels. Will this ever break down completely? Because all these levels of advertisings. I'm not sure I quite, are you saying that um, you're, you're in a game, you get an advertisement for the for, next for game? The next free game that Perhaps monetizing itself by selling another ad for another free game and uh -huh. need to. Well, I, I guess that wouldn't require um, that wouldn't require surveillance because all you all you need to know is that the, the person is playing the game, right? It, it, so, so there, there aren't as many negative effects, I think, and that you've already expressed your interest in the game by playing it. So, number four. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm just um, it's more like a comment, I think. Um, 
so I, I basically I don't watch ads because I have uh, an ad blocker and I, I haven't had a TV for like, I don't know, more than 10 years and things like that. So I really am not, you know, a bear. And then what's really weird is that sometimes people tell me that, hey, you know, I've seen this ad and, you know, have a look, it's really weird. And I'm like, whoa, you know, that's a new product and it's actually useful. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it's the ad. What I'm trying to say is that they're not pushing ad on me. It's like a it's actually valuable information, which I know sounds very strange. But so what I'm trying to say is that if we turn this around, which is what you're tr trying to propose, I think, is that there will be a lack, I mean, that there will be an information flow that will be missing. I mean, I personally thought that that information flow is complete useless uh, information, but it turns out that I had to face the fact that it's not completely useless. Mm -hmm. And so what do you say to that? So the, if, the, if the question is about, you know, ha, without ads, how do we discover new products that we weren't aware of? If it's completely based on our own uh, initiative to go and make the request, then we might miss out on important opportunities. I think that's right. Um, but I think there are other models to, to discover products that you, you might want and need. Um, there are you know, hobbyists who write blogs about particular things that are, that are great, and they, they look at all the new products that are coming out. And that's an impartial source. It's not uh, coming from the seller. And so I think you should, there's always more reason to trust an impartial source than anything that comes from, from the seller. Yeah, but it, I think it's interesting to consider that um, the... Could you just... One question per person, please. <laughs> <laughs> and the next question's right behind you on microphone four as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm thinking of uh, some experiment uh, which was about coffee where they asked some consumers what coffee they want and they all said they want some uh, rich roast, black and strong coffee and when they um, tasted or tested uh, different coffees they all wanted some milky soft coffee thing. <laughs> So, uh, when companies look at that, do you think they will trust um, the opinion of the customers when they see, well, they don't really know what they want? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I, I think it's true that, as I said, we don't really know what we really want. We usually make bad decisions and Sometimes. we usually make suboptimal decisions. Um, but part of that is about uh, tools that allow me to be aware of my own inconsistencies that allow me to understand what I really want um, and when that differs from what I think I want. Um, it's another thing to say that that's a justification for um, putting, leaving all this infrastructure in the hands of, of those who are trying to convince me to buy stuff, especially if, they, if I think that I like a certain thing but my actions reveal I like something else and I might want to change that. Let's say it's, uh, I, I think I want to quit smoking, right? Uh, I, I know that I want to quit smoking, but I keep on smoking. That doesn't mean that I actually do like cigarettes. It's a conflict between my higher decision-making power and my, my, my base decision-making. Okay. Um, next one is number three. Thank you very much for the great talk. Um, if more and more collectives come around, then they'll become a big player in the network that you showed in the beginning. Um, and I'm pretty sure that uh, industry will come up with a smart business model and try to involve them in all their, you know, uh, what they do. Um, have you thought about uh, what they'll come up with and uh, what we should be afraid of and uh, be prepared for? Yeah, yeah, I, I, think, um, I think that they see that and that there's a positive opportunity um, for sellers at least. I think that a lot of the ad industry will, if, if this were to happen, a lot of the ad industry would die off. But I think from the, from the seller perspective, there's a, there's a huge advantage if you don't have to go and acquire consumers. You don't have to spend money on advertising anymore. Um, and that's great. Um, if, I, I mean, if, if the energy switching program was, was what everyone used rather than just sort of 10% of people using it, then you could have an energy company that had no marketing budget but that exclusively, um, so the prices would be lower and they'd always be winning um, the, the custom of the collectives. So I think there's a huge opportunity for businesses to uh, use this model and, and therefore not have to go in for the whole digital advertising model. Next, we have a question from the internet. So uh, what do you think about um, consumer-generated wish list approaches? Are those a good model? Yeah, they're, they're, that's, a, that's a decent model. Um, I know that Amazon has that. Um, and yeah, I think that's a good idea. The problem at the moment is it's centralized. So um, 
if I have a wish list model with uh, a particular vendor, uh, then I only get uh, offers from that vendor. Um, and so uh, uh, another service that could do that um, and, and you know, that could match my wishes with a similar people and aggregate them together, I think that would be a good thing. Next one was on number one. Um, so you talked about uh, collective purchasing, which is now popular for uh, energy markets. You're probably a bit uh, too young for it, but like uh, when we had the new economy in uh, 99 and 2000, there was a lot of collective purchasing for computer, consumer goods like uh, cameras. So basically it worked. Some broker was collecting the requests and whenever they had an order for like 10 cameras, they would send it out. But that magically vanished. So did you do any comparison what went wrong there or why did it vanish and will it vanish again or what did they do wrong in those years? I'm not sure. It's a good question. Um, I think where it has been successful, it's been in markets that are more like utilities than one-off purchases because people have to pay their energy bills or they have to use their bank year in, year out. Um, and so it, if you, if you um, have to do that, it's kind of, you're confronted with that decision so many times that you, at some point you think, well, maybe I should do this in a more efficient way. Whereas if you're buying a camera, um, you might not, you might not th have to consider how you make the decision so many times. So people might not know about them. I think it's hard for that kind of service to get a foothold. And also there's a problem of instant gratification. You can go and buy the camera straight away rather than having to wait for enough other people. Um, but I think, you know, people pledge money on Kickstarter for stuff, you know, 90% of the stuff on, or maybe more on Kickstarter doesn't get funded. Um, but people still um, put their, their money down just in case. So I think there's, it could grow. Next question is on microphone number two. And I don't know whether we'll have enough time to answer all questions standing there, but go ahead. Okay, then I try to uh, make it quick. So I think a lot about empowering consumers and you talked about more about the um, functional and qualitative set of preference consumers may have when purchasing a product, but there's also the dimension of ethical, moral, political values and views that we also may wish to, to express by purchasing. And of course, once you solve the problem of um, combining the purchasing power of consumers, that's great. But I wonder if you've thought about more about really creating transparency on the supply side. So as long as marketers or companies can still create an image that we are making the world a better place by, you know, and that they have very human rights mm -hmm. saving production process. So how, how can you really solve the, the issue of information asymmetry between what the consumer knows and what maybe a big group of people may yeah, no, believe I, they know. I absolutely agree. And I think there are people working on that. So there's things like open product data, open supply chains, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and some companies are making efforts to do that. Um, but I agree that there's a, there's a lot of um, asymmetry and, and it's very opaque at the moment. Um, I think one model you could have would be, okay, um, let's only deal with the ones that say what they do. Um, and, and provide evidence for it. Um, and so the consumer might take a hit because they might miss out on stuff, other stuff that um, is being produced in an ethical way, but it it's, provides an incentive for the suppliers to actually publish that information. Right now, there's just not enough demand for it. But I think in future, it'd be great if there was. And this, this campaign I mentioned, the Move Your Money campaign, they created a lot of that information themselves by going out and doing their own investigations into how the banks were using their, their own money for investments. Um, next is on microphone four. Um, I'm, I'm going to be a bit provocative. So I'm wondering whether you've seen uh, any of those business models you described that were successful on a large scale. Because uh, what you described is intent casting, the, so c collecting consumer demand. It's been tried. Uh, the, I mean, and, and the role has been taken over by social networks. Group buying was tried by Groupon and became a total perversion, a total push uh, model. And assurance contracts, Kickstarter is successful, but it is because it's a destination site in itself, because mm -hmm. there's strong editorial control on what is allowed on Kickstarter or not. So, I mean, I'm, I'm just wondering, have you answered the question already yourself? Consumers are lazy, so there needs to, I mean, the role for intermediaries 
will we will still need the role for intermediaries? Yeah, I think that for for now, yes, um, intermediaries need to be recognised brands in themselves. Um, the, the, there are some in the UK that, that have to do a lot of spend a lot of money marketing themselves and, and demonstrating to consumers that that they exist and that what the value they provide. Um, so I think for now they're most likely to be centralised, but I hope that in future they they won't be. And I think for this model to scale m more widely, I think that it does need to be decentralised. Well, unfortunately, we ran, we ran out of time. Um, maybe you find another room to uh, continue this discussion. Um, thank you for your talk uh, and for the Q&A.